yeah, tell me which is best. This yeah. or yes. one of them? Mm -hmm. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, some terminology to learn when talking about oxygen levels. Um, the first one you've heard about already, hypoxemia. Um, hypoxemia is low level of oxygen in the blood. And that's what we measure with the pulse oximeter or the raw arterial blood. Um, we're looking for hypoxemia, or low oxygen level in the blood. Hypoxia, we can assume, but we can't measure it. That's a low level of oxygen in the cells or tissues of the body. And it just goes to follow that if you don't have enough oxygen in the blood, then your tissues are going to become hypoxic because not enough oxygen is delivered to the tissues. Um, the first one, hypoxic hypoxia. This is alveolar hypoxia, meaning that there's a low level of oxygen in the alveoli. So hypoxic hypoxia could result from um, you standing on a mountain that's you know, 10,000 feet or 5,000 feet into the air and the barometric pressure is lower and that results in less oxygen for you to breathe in and therefore there's less oxygen in your IV line. It would be hypoxic hypoxia. Or you're flying in an airplane at 10,000 feet and the cabin loses pressure and now you don't have the amount of oxygen. That's hypoxic hypoxia. The oxygen is not in your alveoli in order to get into your blood. And then anemic hypoxia is the hemoglobin carrying capacity is reduced either due to low hemoglobin or it says reduced carrying capacity. Um, so reduced carrying capacity means there is something wrong with the hemoglobin and it cannot carry oxygen. So if you want to circle reduced carrying capacity and then just write in terms that you can understand. Say there's something wrong with the hemoglobin and it can't carry oxygen. So we talk about sickle cell anemia. Um, when the cells sickle, they can't carry oxygen. Um, that would be an example of anemic hypoxia. Um, so what if you just have iron poor blood and your body's not making enough red blood cells? Do you think that would classify as anemic hypoxia? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So less hemoglobin to carry the oxygen. So it, it kind of goes along with anemia. Right? Everybody's heard of anemia, low amount of red blood cells. And the next one is circulatory hypoxia. There's low blood flow due to low blood pressure or to cardiac arrest. And the result is low oxygen delivery to the tissues. So if you have low blood flow, you don't have blood carrying a fresh supply of oxygen to the tissues. And if you're not getting oxygen delivered to the tissues, the tissues become hypoxic. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Circulatory hypoxia? And the last one, histotoxic hypoxia, is poisoning of the cells renders oxygen utilization impossible. And in parentheses, it gives you an example. It's cyanide poisoning. Um, cyanide is a poison that is used to kill rats for pest control. But if a person ingests, if a human being ingests it, um, what happens is the cells cannot utilize oxygen. So it poisons the cell, and they can't take in oxygen into the cell. So histotoxic hypoxia, the cells are unable to utilize oxygen. All right, so if you, here's some questions for you, or some application to that. Carbon monoxide poisoning, do you want to write it down so you can review it with yourself later? Um, carbon monoxide poisoning is an example of which type of hypoxia? 
carbon monoxide poisoning. So what happens with carbon monoxide is it'll attach to the hemoglobin and it won't let oxygen attach to the hemoglobin. So would that be hypoxic hypoxia, anemic hypoxia, circulatory hypoxia, or histotoxic hypoxia? <coughs> anemic. Anemic. Why isn't it histotoxic? Right, histotoxic hypoxia is the problem with the cells utilizing the oxygen. And with carbon monoxide poisoning, the cells can utilize oxygen. But the hemoglobin can't carry the oxygen. The sun is not buying that. <laughs> um, all right, so we think carbon monoxide poisons the cells. Is that what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think that it poisons the hemoglobin. Um, the next one is heart failure. Heart failure causes low amounts of oxygen in the tissues. Why? Is it hypoxic hypoxia, anemic hypoxia, circulatory, or histotoxic? Circulatory. Oxygen isn't being delivered to the tissues because of poor cardiac health. And what if you're standing on Mount Everest and your oxygen level is low? Hypoxic, hypoxic, hypoxic. hypoxic, hypoxic. <coughs> All right, some more terminology. Hematocrit is the percentage of whole blood which the red blood cells comprise. Have you ever seen blood when it stands still for a while? The red blood cells are heavy and they kind of fall down to the bottom of a test tube. Mm -hmm. And then on top there's a straw-colored fluid. Mm -hmm. And the red blood cells are usually suspended in that straw-colored fluid. But just the red blood cells themselves are usually about 45% of the whole blood. And the rest is the blood test. And then hemoglobin is inside a red blood cell. Almost all of the oxygen is normally carried from the lungs to the body cells by the hemoglobin. So when you're just talking lay terms, you say, oh, your red blood cells carry oxygen to the tissues of your body. But then getting more detail, um, inside of the red blood cell, there's a molecule called hemoglobin, and that's where the oxygen attaches. So inside the red blood cell is hemoglobin, and that's where oxygen attaches to. A normal amount of hemoglobin is about 15 grams per 100 ml of blood. So um, when you have something per 100 ml of blood, You'll see it written in your book sometimes as percent instead of them writing 100 ml of blood. They'll put gram and then just a percent sign. So do you want to write that next to it so that you remember that they're the same units? So grams per 100 ml of blood is the same thing as grams percent. So it would be a GM and then the percent sign. Okay, and term polycythemia means a higher than normal hemoglobin level. And why would we have higher than normal? You would think our bodies would know, hey, this is how much um, hemoglobin we need. Why would it produce more than the normal amount? <coughs> so if there's long-term um, hypoxia, that stimulates red blood cell production and causes more red blood cells to be produced. So if you're living in the Andes Mountains, your hemoglobin level is going to be higher than somebody living at sea level. Because up in the mountains, your tissues will always notice low levels of oxygen. Because there's less oxygen there. 
So it produces more red blood cells so it can carry the little bit that is in the atmosphere. It has a better ability to carry that little bit of oxygen um, to the tissues of the body. So polycythemia occurs in people that live in the mountains. It occurs in athletes. Can you figure out why athletes would have polycythemia? And they exercise a lot. So. <clears throat> so the exercise is, is probably they're exercising strenuously, mm -hmm. and that's creating low levels of oxygen in the tissues. And when they're doing that a lot, that will stimulate red blood cell production. And then going along with respiratory care are the COPD patients. Um, when their lungs are damaged and they're not getting enough oxygen in the blood, and that happens over a long period of time, it causes the body to produce more red blood cells. So they'll have polycythemia. And anemia, we already mentioned, is decreased hemoglobin levels. And that could be from um, poor nutrition. It takes time, the body needs iron in order to produce red blood cells. So poor nutrition can result in anemia. And I think there's some genetic illnesses that can also result in anemia. All right, some pictures. <coughs> Pardon me. On the left, this donut-shaped object is a red blood cell. And this is showing a capillary, and the red blood cell is in the capillary. And here is the alveolus. So it's kind of cut off, but it's showing oxygen coming into the red blood cell, carbon dioxide leaving. And then if you look inside the red blood cell, that's where you're going to see the hemoglobin molecule. And it's showing that how many oxygen molecules attach to one hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. Three, four. Four oxygen molecules can travel on one hemoglobin molecule. Not that that's a trivial pursuit or anything, but it just shows the efficiency that hemoglobin can carry oxygen. All right, there's two ways that oxygen is carried in the blood. One way is oxygen can dissolve in the plasma of the blood. So we can measure, we can take the blood and we can push it into a machine, it's called a blood gas machine, and it's going to analyze the amount of oxygen in the blood. Um, it can see the, the pressure of oxygen dissolved in the plasma, and then it also measures the percentage of oxygen on the hemoglobin. So in the plasma, when it's measuring the pressure of oxygen in the plasma, it gives a number, the PO2, and also we've already talked about P little AO2 as the pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. It's what's dissolved in the plasma when we're looking at that number. Um, to turn it into mLs, take a pressure and get reading of mLs. We do that by multiplying by 0 0.003. So that's going to tell you there's a very tiny amount that's actually dissolved in the plasma. The hemoglobin carries almost all of the oxygen. So if you're severely anemic, if your hemoglobin drops down to less than 5 grams, it's almost incompatible with life because the plasma of your blood cannot carry very much oxygen. It wouldn't be enough to sustain life. So without red blood cells, you wouldn't be able to get um, oxygen to the tissues of your body. So the oxygen that's attached to the hemoglobin, um, every gram of hemoglobin is capable of combining with 1.34 mLs of oxygen. And where does that number come into importance? It comes up in a second. There's an equation coming up. So this shows how it's showing a capillary. It says plasma. We've got oxygen dissolved in the plasma. And then we also have hemoglobin with oxygen on it, the red blood cells. Are carrying oxygen. 
So the picture's just trying to say the same thing that I just talked about. There's two ways that oxygen is carried in the blood, either attached to hemoglobin or dissolved in the plasma. And did you know that we can calculate the content of oxygen in the blood? So there's our formula. The formula of the day is oxygen content. <laughs> Not wait. It's easy. You can just plug the numbers in and you come up with the value. <coughs> But isn't that easier than the critical thinking questions? <laughs> there you go. All right, so oxygen content is called C, capital C, little a, O, 2, oxygen content. And the units are going to be mLs of oxygen per 100 mLs of blood. So anytime you have 100 mLs of blood, you can just put the percent sign. So it's called volumes per cent a lot of times. So you know how you always have to mention units when you calculate something? So when you're calculating oxygen content, you can say mLs per 100 mLs of blood, or you can just say volume percent, VOL with a percent sign. All right, so when there's HB, we need to know the patient's hemoglobin content, and that's what we plug in for HB. Um, 1.34 is always going to be constant. And what it is, um, it refers to the number of milliliters of oxygen carried by each gram of hemoglobin. So 1.34 mLs of oxygen are carried by each gram of hemoglobin. So that number stays the same every time we use this formula. Next is the saturation of oxygen of arterial blood. And it's in a percent form. When you put the percent into an equation, you have to switch it over to decimal form. So if the saturation is 93%, what are you going to put into the formula? Yes, 0.93. Um, the pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is in millimeters mercury, so that stays the same. And then the constant, 0 0.003, that's going to convert the pressure into mLs, volumes per cent. Okay, so it wants us to calculate the normal oxygen content for arterial blood. <coughs> So if the hemoglobin level is 15 grams per 100 ml, so 15 grams per cent, that's a normal hemoglobin level, so we're going to plug that in. The saturation, 99%. When we plug that into the equation, you put 0.99. And then you'll plug in the pressure of oxygen from the plasma, 100 millimeters mercury, which is normal.
your equation look like this, if you could see it from where you were? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what did you get for this portion? 20.0? You're going to use the tenths place. So 20.0? 19.8. 19.8? 19.9. So it's going to be 19.9. So it's going to be 19.9. 19.99 or something like that? It's 19.89. Oh, All right, and then the 100 times 0 0.003 is 0.3. 0.3. So when you add 19.9 and 0.3, you get 20.2 lines per cent. So you're going to use tenths place. I know with, with the last exam you were asking me how many places. Um, so when you report your answer, you're going to go to the tenths place to report your answer. For your final answer, do you want us to always round them? <coughs> to the tenths place. To the tenths place. Okay. Um, so when you're looking at what's carried on the hemoglobin and what's carried in the plasma, look at the big difference in the two numbers. Mm -hmm. So can you see from the formula how very little is carried in the plasma and almost all of it's carried in the hemoglobin? Mm -hmm. Alright, so that shows you the importance of hemoglobin. So you're asked, well, as a respiratory therapist, why do you care about hemoglobin levels? And now you know why. And then um, we're going to do a second calculation. Calculate the oxygen content of a patient who is anemic. Their hemoglobin level is 9 grams per deciliter. Saturation is good. Their PaO2 is good. Um, but what does the content come out to be? So the only thing you're changing is the 9 grams of hemoglobin. Anybody need a calculator? So when you multiplied 9 times 1.34 times 0.99, what did you get? 11.9. .9. And then we had 0.3 over here. And that came out to 12.2. All right, so we had everything the same. Our oxygen saturation was the same. The amount dissolved in the plasma was the same. And the only difference is this person's anemic, they don't have much hemoglobin. And notice how much lower the oxygen content is. So we went from 20 gram or 20 volumes per cent down to 12 volumes per cent, just because they were anemic. So somebody like that, you wonder why they're tired and why they don't have the energy to do things. Well, that's why. You know, their cells aren't getting the oxygen delivery that somebody with a normal hemoglobin level has. Um, and then it asks, does a low hemoglobin affect the carrying capacity of the blood? It doesn't affect the carrying capacity of the blood? Yeah, so the content is a lot lower with a low hemoglobin. So yes, the carrying, you can answer yes tremendously. And then write this question into your notes. Um, can you look at the O2 saturation, or the SpO2? You guys have learned SpO2 already, right? Mm -hmm. Saturation from a pulse ox. Mm -hmm. Can you look at SpO2 
and tell if a patient is anemic. Can you look at SPO2 and tell if a patient is anemic? Just looking at O2 sets. No, you can't. So, one of the mistakes that I, I hear frequently is you'll hear somebody say, their oxygen saturation is low, they must be anemic. No, you can't tell that they're anemic unless you draw blood and uh, find out what the hemoglobin level is. So you can't look at O2 sats and know if a patient is anemic. A low O2 sat does not mean anemia. And that's where we stop. Yay. That was painless, right? <laughs>